Welcome back, everyone, to our final guest speaker session today. Here on stage with me is Shelly Terrell. Hello, nice to see you here. Shelly is... Uh, Shelly is a digital innovator, an international speaker, and the author of Hacking Digital Learning Strategies. She's also the winner of the National Association of Professional Women's Woman of the Year Award. She's trained teachers in more than 20 countries and is currently a teacher in Texas. So welcome, Shelly. Thank you for being here. And uh, we're all looking forward to your presentation. Well, thank you. And I'm so excited that you all are joining me today. I'm so excited to um, be here and to be able to present to teachers who are taking time out of, I know, their very busy day um, to be here. And I know some of you have lasted the entire conference, so congratulations. And if you haven't, I know there will be recording soon. So I want to go ahead and encourage you, um, if you have any of those students that are maybe too shy or they're just not, you feel like they're not getting enough of that, um, the good speech out or conversations, um, I want to share with you some resources and tools for that. I tend to get super excited, share a lot. Sometimes I go a little fast. So it's, I like to say my presentations are a little bit like a buffet. You go to a buffet, you see all this delicious food, and you want to eat it all, but you know your stomach's going to hurt and you're not going to feel good. So I recommend put two items on your plate. Enjoy those. You can always come back. You can go to ShellyTerrell.com slash speaking, and you can get the resources, and then you can also get... Um, um, the slide presentation out as well immediately. And if you have questions, I can always add more materials. I have over 500 presentations, so I can probably help you with something. <laughs> um, I'm excited to get started. I do want to say a thank you to all the organizers. They've been working really hard. Um, they're what they're giving away is amazing and you'll get to see that at the end too. So I'm really, really happy to be here and thank you for coming as well. One of the reasons why it's so important to have speaking in our classrooms and, and not only for multilingual learners, and that's what we now um, term English learners in Texas. I actually just came from teaching my middle schoolers. Um, I'm an ELA teacher there and then I also work with the, our multilingual learner population there as well. And so I'm gonna use ideas that have worked for me, even teaching two-year-olds all the way to 99 years old. Um, and these have always gotten students encouraged to speak in class. But one of the most important reasons why we need that speech in class and to optimize that time is because um, student-centered classrooms are all about voice. So student voice um, and then being able to voice their opinions is so important, especially with a teacher around, because I found that that really helps build relationships that gets the students to get to know you. And then that also helps you to help them to um, increase their vocabulary, but also to feel like they can make a difference, that their words matter. And even if they have a strong accent or no matter where in the world they are, they're gonna be the ones who really impact the world because um, they are multilingual speakers. And so I think that's really important. I'm going to break this up into solo activities and then move on to pair and group. You're going to see a lot of tools. Um, most of them have some kind of freemium, so you can always try them with your students. They These are the ones that I find much easier to use with students. It doesn't take a long time to get to know the tool. Um, it's pretty easy to use the tool. I will give you ideas on how to use those tools as well. And then I'm gonna give you ideas for also not using any technology at all. And I think you're gonna find those are really exciting because those are the ones that get students out of their seat and really using the language that they know and putting it into those conversations. So let's start first with solo speaking activities and tools. And even though you might see like a child here, these are for adults and teens as well. In fact, I'm going to start with a tool that's pretty great for uh, adult learners, um, college, high school, even adolescents. Children can use this tool as well, but it does work with older learners very well. And this is called Bukaroo. 
Vukuru is available on a website. It's free. You don't even have to register. And then you can also um, use it on a mobile device. In fact, we're going to get a little bit of practice with this. So one of the reasons I love Vukuru is because you have so many options to send. You can get a link, as you can see here. You can also get a, uh, you can embed it in a Canva on a Google Classroom on a website so it's there for your students in fact if you do do it on a website um or like a canva it it comes out looking like this and they know click the red button and that's as simple as it is you click the red button and then you speak if you don't like it you delete it and you do it again so um it's very very simple to use you can download it so if you want to collect that you can always have your students on your LMS, they can send you the link or they can download it and they can send you the file. We're gonna try with the QR code. So one of the ways that I use Bukuru is that I have a QR code, they uh, scan it and you're gonna scan it right now. And if you scan this message with your mobile device, um, you use the picture one. So if you haven't used QR before, um, you can, if you have a newer phone, um, you can scan it with your uh, phone, the picture, and then it, it comes up and pops up, and then you just click open it. And when you open it, you'll automatically be able to play, and then you'll be able to hear my five-year-old Savannah speak to you. Savannah is a multilingual learner. She's wearing her Unidos shirts there, Unidos, and she speaks Spanish and she speaks English. She goes to bilingual school she would love for you to leave her a message she gets very excited so that's my um activity for you in the on the top right and i don't know if you can see my phone you may not be able to see but you can see really quick you can see the bukuru recording there you can press play and then at the top right it has a little um microphone that says record and then you can record it and you can send it to shelly terrell at gmail.com let her know where you're from and you can do that anytime. I'll get in my email. I'll play it for her. And then, you know, we can we can send you something as well. Maybe I can send you, um, you know, a PDF of, of extra information or something like that. Okay. I'm going to play it for you just in case you weren't able to hear it yet. But if you were able to hear it, then you can um, type in the chat um, her if you were able to hear her greeting. Okay. So I'm going to play it for you. Hello, my name is Savannah. It's nice to meet you. Okay, so there you go. <laughs> yeah, if you put a thumbs up, that's great. <laughs> and so that was Bukuru. Pretty, pretty easy to use. <laughs> One of the great things um, with a solo activity like this is you can start it off in your classroom right away. That can be one way to make sure they visit your website, to make sure that they visit your LMS, your Canva, your Google Classroom, is to have that greeting and then they tell you about themselves. Sometimes I do a three, two, one greeting. I will let them know, okay, your recorded response, I wanna know um, three things that you like. I want to know two facts about you and one place you would travel if you had all the money in the world or what is your dream job, just depending on what type of learner it is. You can ask, you can put, post um, a question and this can be like a speaking prompt. This can be something they visit once a week and then they are asked to share their opinions on a topic or whatever you're teaching. And then it can also be where they answer questions in response to something they read, an article or maybe a video they watched and how it made them feel. Later on, I'm going to talk to you about different types of support to elevate that speech, to make sure that they have the type of language, the vocabulary to be able to complete that task um, and learn how to increase their um, speaking fluency as well. But I do want to introduce you to a tool you have available with Ellie. So Ellie actually has their own recording tool, and it's really great because they already do the planning for you. So you don't even have to come up with your own questions. They literally have like hundreds of lessons and 
they have different ways that they have the students use their speaking tool. As you can see, it's the same kind of procedure. They click the red button and they start um, speaking, as, they start speaking and recording their response. So it's as simple as that. Before they do that, they have several tasks to prepare them to have the speech that is um, created for that, that learning as well. They have business English, they have travel English. Um, in the last one with the flashcards, I did hear about going to the doctor. So they have everything covered. Another way that they use the tool is that they have the read aloud. And this is really great because one of the things, if you use, I love Vukuru, it's amazing, awesome. We can use it in different ways. But if you do get them on Ellie, if they're doing a read aloud, it's already there for them. And that's so important as a support for multilingual learners. So sometimes their multilingual learners don't talk because they feel like they're gonna make mistakes. So we create in our classroom when we do the norms, when we talk at the beginning, hey, this is a safe place. You're gonna make mistakes. And that's the way you learn, but that's okay. Because especially in a tool like Ellie, I'm gonna be the one listening to you and then I get to help you. So if you have that conversation with them beforehand, then they can feel more comfortable being able to say um, and, and complete the task. And then also let them know, hey, right there, it's for you. So when you are doing like a read aloud or you're answering a question, there's some uh, words there that are already there for you to make you feel comfortable. The other thing I really love is what in the read aloud section, they also have the immersive reader. Many different tools have Microsoft's free immersive reader. This is made for language learners. It's made for language learners who also have other issues. So a majority of my, I have 59 um, different um, learning needs, okay? And they have plans written out. And, and it's not only that they're English learners, um, but also they have dyslexia or maybe they have dysgraphia and they have other um, learning issues as well and challenges. And so Immersive Reader is made for that. It's made to where it breaks it down to syllables. They can make it bigger. They can make it go slower at their pace, the speed of how they're reading. It, high, it even will change to a different language. It has a picture dictionary. And that's embedded in Ellie. So there you have everything for you. Another way that they use that speaking tool is through speaking assessment. So they have a picture prompt and then your students have to come up with their own language, their own vocabulary, what they already know to describe what is happening in the picture. This is really great for a do now. So even if you use the picture projected and then you want the class to, to you know, on their different devices um, to be able to describe that picture, they can do that as well. And that's as soon as they come in the classroom, they're, that's the task that they have there. And be, my students, they love when they have picture prompts. They do it much better with that than any other kind of prompts. Um, they participate in that a lot more. The next tool I want to show you is Blabberize. Blabberize is where you can draw a picture and then basically you put a voice to the picture. So one of the ways that I've used it is with my very young learners when I was teaching two-year-olds to four-year-olds in Germany. And so they, of course, were a little shy when not speaking German, but they did with Blabberize. They loved it because they could make their little characters speak. And so they could draw little mouths on them and then they put the uh, the little mouth, they actually have a tool that makes a mouth, they play it and that little mouth speaks. And so uh, Blabberize is, is really neat. This is when we were doing, um, we were singing, where is Thumpkin? And so I would sing it and then they would go and they would make their little hands and then they would make their hands speak, okay? Their little Thumpkin. And then they would make their, you know, their pinky have a very high voice like this. And that made it very exciting for them to want to speak as well. Another great tool for adolescents, teens, and young learners. You can even do this with adults. They do have like Barack Obama and they have some other different types of political figures. My German students, my adult German students who are like 60, 70, 80, 
they loved anything that had to do with American politics. And so I find that when you're teaching abroad, if you can relate it to that, where you say, okay, you're making up the presidential speech, or maybe you're going to be um, uh, this certain celebrity. Oh, they have soccer players on there. They can make famous soccer players um, as well. So um, there is a free version of Voki.com. It will not save that avatar for you or let you embed it. So students just go, they don't have to register and they can just create the speech for it. Uh, they can record their own voice talking. One of the great things about Voki is, especially if you have teens and adolescents, if they have an avatar, even with very young learners, if they have a puppet or a character speaking, all of a sudden, they're not as shy because it's not them speaking. It's not them making mistakes. It's their character making a mistake with their English or something. So if you really see that your students are struggling with that, then start getting them to use avatars, start getting them to use puppets, and you're going to see that it's going to really help them as well to get out of their shell. Even the, the ones that are um, super shy, um, will we'll get out of their shell if they have an avatar. And they just love playing around with the characters, the background, and all of that. There is a bulky classroom, but you have to pay a subscription for it. One of the tools I'm going to give you, and I'm just going to let you know that, uh, and I'm going to put this, um, I'm going to keep updating my speaking site, is I have different rubrics for this. So you can edit them, they're Google Docs, and then you can, I, I have these in my books as well. I have, um, I think, now four books. Uh, so, but I, I'm also providing these to you. You can go to ShellyTerrell.com. You can even search rubric and you will find them for many different tasks that you see here. This is one for an avatar. And basically this is how I assess. If students meet the mark, if there's a script they were supposed to write out and read, then um, I, I check whether or not that was part of it. If there was key words they were supposed to use within uh, that how their avatar was designed, did it meet the task? If we asked them to do, for example, a political speech and they used a beaver and we weren't talking about beaver as well, then they get a few points off, okay? Um, and then the recording, were they, did they record it and make sure that they were in a quiet place or, um, and I understand in different backgrounds, we have so much going on, but if we let students know, okay, we'll just, you know, um, make sure as, at the least amount of noise, so that way you can hear your voice as well. Attribution and licensing, and then of course, any grammar areas that you've covered. So I let my students know, here is your goal. These are the grammar goals. If you make a mistake in something that's not that goal, I'm not gonna take points off. But since we're learning, for example, the present tense, then that's what I'm gonna look for. And so we keep practicing that. And then they they do their recording. They can record as much as they want. If they don't like their grade, then the great thing about a tool is then you're able to tell them, you can redo it. You can record it. And because they have that ability, they get very excited about it. Toontastic is another way to do a digital storytelling project. So with Toontastic, that's completely free because now Google took over it. I believe you can, you have to download it for Windows, so it's a program, and then I believe you can get it as an app with a Chromebook, okay? You can have different characters, the students create a story, and then they narrate those characters. It also walks them through the storytelling process, like it tells them, okay, plot, it shows them what a plot is, climax, it teaches them climax by having them create that story, so that's really neat as well. So which of these tools, I've introduced a whole bunch, I know. So um, if I'm going kind of fast, like I said, you can go to shellyterrell.com slash speaking. But which of these tools seems the most exciting with your particular group of learners? You can choose which ones. Is it going to be like the Voki, the Avatar? Is it going to be um, that Vocaroo? Is it going to be the Ellie speaking, the Reedy Aloud, or the Picture Prompts? Um, or is it going to be um, one of the other ones that I showed you? Okay, so, <laughs> or maybe it's all of these you're going to try. Toontastic, yeah. I say try one or two. See how it works for you see what the kinks are, what you have issues with, or what your students are going to have issues with. So for example, with the Vukuru, if you didn't know where 
the button was to record, then you know, okay, I'm going to have to point to them um, how to record. So now we're going to go to parent group speaking activities. My recommendation is you start off with pairs. Teach them how to get used to that pair work. And also because if they're in a small group of three then or four, they can still hide. Okay, they can still, if they're very, very shy, then they can say, oh, time ran out, teacher. I'm not going to be able to do this activity. So with pairs, at least they're still forced to be able to respond back and have that time as well. And so I'm going to teach, show you some group activities that you don't need any technology um, and as well. But I would start with pairs. When you're grouping the pairs, I like to do a level below and a level high. So, for example, if it's an advanced speaker, then maybe an intermediate. I don't want to put them with too low of a speaker, if possible. And the reason for that is um, they can help each other, uh, but a too advanced with the very beginner is not going to get as much learning out of that. And so we want to make sure that we optimize the learning for all of our students. An advanced learner will with the intermediate because they don't have to help them with everything. They can still respond to each other and then correcting them on certain things helps them to remember and, and to also be better um, with those different types of skills that they're struggling with as, as well. Um, all are have a freemium, so that's a really good question. I did see that in the chat, which of the tools are free. They all have a freemium. In other words, your students can use all of those tools for free with something. But then, you know, after you get a taste of the tool, the one you like is the one, you know, you can go out and see if your school will get the whole thing for. <laughs> so one of the ones my students really love, and we get to try this out in a virtual format, is a class poll. So this is me with my adult students in Brazil. So this was a very long time ago. Um, I'm the one at the front there. With a classroom where I have room, I like to put um, masking tape or some kind of line. And then the students are voting. And there's different ways. They can either do yes and no questions you can propose to them. For adults, uh, I mean, for teens and adolescents, they love would you rather, OK? so. You, if you're getting trouble with them speaking, try would you rather. They love it. They love would you rather. And then there's pro con, and that's for adults as well. Likes, dislikes, um, they like that as well. So when you frame it, then you may ask a question like, for example, um, if you are um, if you are for a school dress code, jump to the left. If you disagree with having students have a dress code jump to the right and then they do their jumping and i think because of the energy they get so excited they want to talk because they just start talking but then after they jump they have to face the other line they have to face someone and then they have to i say okay line right side you have to explain your choice you know you have to give a reason at least one reason and you're trying to convince someone from the other side to jump over to your side or at least maybe go in the middle. OK, and then what they do is they um, the other side, I let them speak. So I always have a timer. It could be your your phone, but I actually have a real timer, a big wall timer. I press and I say, OK, you have one minute to say, you know, your reasonings and convince the other side. And then at the end of the question, I ask them, OK, is there anyone who maybe changed a little? Would you want to go to the middle or do you want to jump to the other side? So it gets them talking. With my middle schoolers, I have about 30 of them in the classroom. I cannot divide it. So now I've done a stand up, sit down poll. So if they if, and we're going to do one right now and I'll show you how to do this virtually, but I'll ask them a question like if you believe that rap music is much better than country music, stand up. OK, and if you prefer country music, then you sit down and then they have to find someone next to them. And then I will tell them something like, OK, with likes and dislikes, I will ask them to explain to the partner, OK, share what country music artists you like or share what you know, what songs you like. And they get really excited and they just start talking anyway. After a few rounds with any of these, with any age level, 
I ask the students to give me topics. They want to do topics. They start raising their hands. And I've um, recently I had one student and he never likes to participate. He's the cool student. You know what I mean? So he loved this so much. He kept, can I do a topic? Can I do? And I said, yes, of course. So then he stands up. He writes the topic on the board and um, it was, you know, if you rather watch soccer or would you rather watch basketball? It was it's something like that. And he was so excited to see the rest of the students discuss his topic. So it's very motivating. I have not found a student that really doesn't like this. So we're going to do this in the chat. You can also do this in breakout rooms if you're in a Zoom. This is a way that you can get them to poll. They all have to type in what they either A for agree or D for disagree. But in this case, you can also use an emoji. So if you want to put, um, so the poll is dogs are better pets than cats. Now, this is the most popular one I use with my students that get so much language speaking um, there for all age groups, even adults, okay? So you can type in A if you agree or D if you disagree. And then after you do that, I want you to give me a reason for your choice, okay? And, you know, it would start off with like cats do this or dogs do this. And so they really, really, really like, um, they love this a lot. I always get um, students who are always telling me. So in the chat, you can do this as um, right now as well. If you agree that dogs are better than cats, then you would put an A. I'm going to put A and then <laughs> put my reasoning. A, because I had a pug that always gave me kisses, but my kitten would scratch me. <laughs> but I've had all kinds of students. One of the great things about these kind of projects is that students are able to share with you um, their experience. And when they're talking about themselves, they have more language for that. So, and I love that conflicted. I have both. Okay. So I think that, and then they, they're able to suddenly like give reasons. We're going to show you how they can find the words in case they just struggle so much. And I have some speakers this year that only speak Spanish. That's all they speak. They don't speak any English at all. And they're still able to complete the task. They're still able to speak to their peers. And I'll show you how I give them that support um, soon so they can be more um, successful with these. Okay, so we had some very great responses here. You don't have to take a cat for a walk. That is so true. But you do with the dog. That is, And at 6 in the morning as well. Um, this is when I was um, in the UK. And so one of the things we did was a ball toss. So this is more of a group discussion. This is where they throw the ball. And whoever throws the ball will ask the student a question they threw the ball to. And that student answers. Now, what you can do in the background, you might see there's a whiteboard. Um, and here you might see a very famous person. This is Chia. I don't know if you um, uh, Chia is a very good friend of mine. She's in the UK. And um, this was actually her classroom I got to work with. So I was very excited to be with her adult students there in the UK. Um, and I think it was at International House. But you write the vocabulary on the board, or you can even write the questions that they can choose from, like a question bank. Question banks or vocabulary word banks really help students to um, be able to find the words so they're able to complete the task. And so I recommend you have one with every single um, task that is a speaking task. And then you'll notice that more students, if you can have them in little sheets of paper and then just print it out, especially if you use the same language again and again, um, the same vocabulary or sentence frames or sentence starters, then you can have that next to them and then they can just read off of it. There's another one called drawing directions. And what drawing directions is, is where one student will describe a monster. Um, I There was um, a very famous speaker for dog me. His name is Luke Metting. And uh, Luke did this with a group of us in Turkey. And it was amazing. You know, we all drew a monster. You have to hide the monster. And then you describe it to a partner. And that partner has to make your monster. My monster has three eyes, but it's at the top of their forehead. 
the three eyes and it goes in a row and they learn like the more specific they are, the better their monster is going to turn out. So you can do this as a whole group. Like you start off first, you model, you're the one who um, describes the monster. I always say, hey, students, we have, I use alien now. There's an alien who came to our school. It's a new student. Before you see this alien, I want you to go ahead and um, I have a picture of the alien. I'm going to ask you to draw based on what you hear me say. And then I model it for them. They draw. They love it. They have a great time doing this. And then they they do it in pairs. So they repeat the activity in pairs. The next one is students love their phones. My adults would take phone calls in the classroom. <laughs> it was kind of crazy. So one of the things, uh, I have a lot of activities. I have a book called Learning to Go, and it's everything with mobile devices. And here's one of the more popular ones, which is show and tell with the cell. So students can get out their cell phone. They can basically open a picture, and then they're going to share that picture. This is actually a picture of mine, okay? So there's two ways you can do this. You can have where they just are in a small group of three or four and they talk about the picture. This is a picture of when I did this. This is where I went. And then you can you can have those um, details. You know, they have to say the setting or they have to say who are the people with them. Were they indoors? Were they outdoors? So you can add, you can help them with the language for that. Or what we're going to do next is we're going to play like a 20 questions game, okay? We're not really going to do 20 questions, but you can have instead where they show the picture and their peers, their, the other students in their group, have to ask them each a question about the, about the photo. Usually I start off with either, if it's low beginners, I'll say yes and no questions. Um, is that a dog? You know, something very simple so they can complete the task. If it's a little bit more intermediate and advanced, then I'll put what, who, why, when, where, and then it's uh, or how. Okay. And then that's the questions that they'll be asking for that um, particular peer. Okay. So online, you can type in the chat uh, who, what, where, when, why question for me to answer about my photo. And then afterwards, I'll answer a few questions and then you can take a guess. I want you to guess who are the people in this uh, photo? Where am I in this photo? Because I am there and where might we be? Okay, so that's what you're trying to do. This is actually a picture from my phone. You're trying to guess who these two people could be and you can ask me questions. Um, you can type them in the chat and then I can also answer these questions um, as well. So you can get uh, a guess. Am I taking the photo? Yes, I am. What city? So these are great questions. I'm in San Antonio, Texas. Yes, this is Savannah and her father. Yes, thank you. Okay, so we got one guess. A guess. Is this your daughter? Yes, it is my daughter. Okay, so now that we have a, is this my family? Yes, it is my family. You see all the different questions that are generated? Now you can take a guess. So after like about a minute or two, they can take, is this the children's museum? That is a great guess. It is not. Where is this fun room? Okay, is this picture taken at a famous place? These are wonderful, wonderful questions. What museum is this? Actually, Patricia, you got it right. This was the color music. It's called like the color museum or something that is inside now san antonio in the river walk so <laughs> yes savannah is wearing the cutest dress isn't she <laughs> uh, so there you go the students of course can and then they can share the stories as well there's so many activities there i can't share all of them because we're running out of time but there are ways that you can have debates role plays news broadcasting the news and if you go to shellyterrell.com you're going to find the this presentation that they're speaking but if you just you just um search debate news interviews podcasts you're going to find a, a resource page and rubrics and graphic organizers and all kinds of materials for this digital storytelling, think, pair, share, um, discussions, chain stories, all of that, um, that you have um, available to you. So you can just search at shellyterrell.com in the search tool as well.
Role plays. So different types of ways that they can do role plays. I love role plays. I think this is a great um, pair work activity. And then just some of the ideas that I have are to have characters in a book. So sometimes your students, um, they have a t hard time acting just depending on their age. Little kids, they love to act. Um, even some middle school, fifth graders, they love to act. Adults, not all the time. College students, some yes. And then um, very older adults. So if they're playing some character like, okay, um, especially like political characters, they love that. Okay. So you're the president and you're having a debate with the president. Okay. So you're the person, you're the reporter, you're the president. What questions are you going to ask um, the, you know, President Biden or something like that? And they get really into it. Um, the other thing is dialogues between historical or famous people. So if you share a dialogue or a speech, and then you want them to um, investigate or analyze that dialogue, um, different types of language in that dialogue, like the present perfect or uh, maybe the past or something. Then you choose a dialogue and then they practice it. You, they can go off the script, tell them they can go off the script, but basically they're they're playing that. I like to think of uh, the Stephen Douglas debates, okay? So you had where there was a famous, um, and this is an American history thing, but there, and, and there's also the prime minister and other things like that where they can, you know, uh, be between two people. Okay, what if Einstein and Charlie Chaplin, actually they did meet, they were best friends. What do you think a conversation would have gone um, between those two over dinner, okay? Um, or something like that. Characters impacted by a situation. Okay, you two are in a bus and you accidentally switched each other's bags. So what kind of conversation are you gonna have, okay? So these are different ways to get them speaking in a role play. One of the best tools that we have for a whole class that gets lots of students speaking and is free is Flipgrid. Students love video. They love taking selfies. This is a class discussion. If you haven't used Flip before, it was formerly Flipgrid. Now it's infoflip.com. Uh, Students just record a response. They can put a smiley face if they don't want to show themselves on there. They can put a presentation in the back and they can point to it. They can put weather. They can do a broadcast and be like, in today's, and then you'll see the cloud and stuff. So there's so many ways that they can use Flip. And these teachers already have a bunch of different um, Flip discussions already prepared. In fact, most of the time, I don't even create my own. I copy somebody else's and then I use it for my students. I've done that like within five minutes where I'm like, oh, they're running out of, you know, this lesson's too short. I want them to record a flip. So then I just go and then I just find one and then I'm like, okay, go to the link and then record your flip. And then they respond to each other. So it's really great. It has a filtering system. So if you do teach teen or college students, and their language, like my teens, their languages, they have a filtering system. So that's really awesome as well. Mm -hmm. Voice thread. So voice thread, I loved. I used to use all the time. Um, now I use Flip more, but it's still a really great tool. Here you see all the students on the side. It's less visible. So students can be avatars. They don't have to show themselves or the picture or anything like that. And then they can read. Like for this, it was they created art and poetry together. And then they're reading their poem aloud. One of the great things about this, um, and then the other one is it's asynchronous. So what it means is like you don't have to be live in the present. Like we are now listening to get the benefit of it. You can also get that benefit um, later on. So the students can go back. They can listen as many times as they want to. They can comment on each other's. And so and with Flip as well. If you are doing interviews, so that's a popular, you know, a speaking activity, really easy to get students with. And I know I'm going a little fast now, but that's because we're wrapping up pretty soon. And I want to get some of these resources too. StoryCorps is something that I always use with students. Um, it has everyday people from all over, all walks of life, all cultures. They have two minute to five minute conversations. So the students get to hear that authentic, they go in a booth. So I found this in Chicago. They actually had a building full of these booths. They just go, they record themselves interviewing a parent, a sister, a best friend. You see these amazing stories come out of it. And then they help you with resources such as they have great questions. So one of the ways to really support our students is to provide them the language. So for every speaking task, your students should have either a little card 
or on the whiteboard. They should have vocabulary, sentence starters, sentence frames. We should model that as well. We should model using that language. So, you know, we might have someone come up, interview us, and then what they will do is um, then I will use, I'll say, okay, I'm going to use this question or here, why don't you use this question? And that student will ask me that question and then I will answer, okay? So it, it we always need to model it with our students. If they see we are brave and we're able to do this and we're excited to do this, then it's gonna help them too. Instead of just saying, okay, here, you're gonna be an airplane conductor, you're gonna be a passenger and have a conversation, okay? So that's kind of putting them on the spot. So if you prepare them and you get them ready for that time they have to speak in front of somebody else, then they won't be as nervous. If you do do something like a podcast or you're evaluating like a project, and I do have it under ShellyTerrell.com slash audio, ShellyTerrell.com slash podcast, then you're going to see all these handouts, these scripts. You're going to see all of that to help your students, predictions they can make, where they can evaluate their own podcast before they do their own. Okay, so all of these graphic organizers to help. All of that is part of scaffolds and supports. So we have visuals. We can have students that are, you know, talking and we show, you know, a cloud above them using that particular language. Sentence stems and frames. I have that for every single lesson. Even if it's not a speaking one, I have it every day in my classroom. I think of a sentence stem or a sentence frame. Word banks, you know, our vocabulary, we have our word wall, but also I have a little, you know, on a sheet, maybe some words. And what I like to do is walk around and I will tick when someone uses it. And so afterwards, after their conversation, I say, you know what? I really liked when Juliana said, um, use the word, um, for example, camouflage. She talked about her cat and she said how um, her cat camouflaged with the blanket. And so when you start praising them like that, not going around and doing their errors, but flip it over, start saying specific speeches you heard when you were walking around with the conversation, then you're gonna notice more of your students are gonna be speaking because they want you to point out their conversation. Every day, I, I also have a, a list of my students and I tick off the ones I gave praises to to make sure that in the next one, I find some other ways to um, encourage and, and give specific feedback to those who I haven't gotten to yet. And the more you do that, the more you know about your students, but also you're going to see they're going to get out of their shell. They're going to talk more. Modeling, um, think aloud. So think aloud is a great uh, way to support your students. This is when every time you walk around the room and you're doing your lesson, you share what you're thinking in your head. You model how you think about this. Okay, I'm gonna have to have this conversation with um, um, Charlie Chaplin and Einstein. Hmm, they were best friends. What did Charlie Chaplin do? I'm gonna think to my head, oh, he was a silent film actor. So maybe they told a lot of jokes. They seem like Einstein. And then when you model what you're thinking, like you actually say what's in your mind, your students are going to see how to think about the prompt, how to go about it. And so that's really an important way to elevate their language, but also to see how to think about that task as well. And then in Texas, we use exemplars all the time. It means examples of what your expectations are, of what this looks like in the end. So the great thing is Ellie has sentence starters for you. So I know how I said I have sentence starters for everything. I don't make up those sentence starters. Sometimes I do, but most of the time I will go to a place like Ellie and then I see a whole database of them or I'll go on Twitter too and I see posters where teachers already created this. I take from them and then those are my sentence starters for the day. Ask, this one is on the language of opinion. So they're sentence starters for that. They call them sentence starters, sentence frames, sentence stems. Sentence frame when it's more like a fill in the blank. I, I believe this line, comma, because dot. So you can find them for anything, for an argument, for an opinion, for going to the doctor. You can find sentence starters, sentence frames 
for all of them here. I think I feel, I don't think, in my opinion, as far as I'm concerned, you're also teaching them that academic language. And every time that they do that, you know, you go around, oh, sorry, that's my buzzer saying I need to wrap up soon. But every time you do that, you, you're encouraging them to say, ooh, I heard. Sometimes I'll do like a little ding when I hear it. Um, I'll, I'll have like a little bell and I'll be like, yes, somebody just used, in my opinion, or as far as I'm concerned with the really tough ones. And when you get excited about it, then the students get excited about it too. You know, they, or they just like to see you all excited and happy because they love their teacher, right? Okay. Um, so before I leave, um, I was showing you all those uh, started or get some questions going for you and I can answer some of your questions. Um, I do have to give credit. So I use a lot of really great stock photos and stuff. And sometimes with them, I recently discovered one called Free Pick, and I have to give like the image credit for all of that. So if you like the pictures, you can use them there yourself, and you can use them with Free Pick. They're also really great for those photo prompts. They're great for a writing prompt, and so you can find just a whole bunch of really cool ones. That is me and my daughter there. Those are two of my books that are recently in print while I'm still working to update the other ones, so to speak. So they're more modern. Uh, you can always get a hold of me at Shell Terrell. That's where I am on um, Twitter. Facebook.com, Shelly Terrell. I share resources there and Twitter every day. You can find my blog, teacherbootcamp.com, or you can go to my website and you can find pretty much any topic I think that you can think of. I learned from a lot of others as well. And so it was really, really great talking with you all today. I'm going to go ahead and um, leave it to our raffle and then also answer any questions or share any other resources where you have like a specific need. I can do that as well. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Shelly. That was great. Really, really, really wonderful. Uh, I want to invite everyone to leave their questions in the Q&A section for us. I see a few questions here, but not that many. So if you guys have some questions in your mind, now is the time to drop them in that section. Uh, but I will start with one. Shelly, do you think that you could stop sharing your screen for just a second? Yes, so absolutely. Yeah. So now okay, I there we go. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so let's start with this question here, which is, do you have uh, ideas on encouraging students to participate in discussions in synchronous online class? Yes, and for that, I want to share a resource because, so what I do when we have, so first of all, breakout rooms, breakout rooms, breakout rooms, okay? So it, the smaller the groups, the better it is. And I've done this with young learners um, in Zoom when I was doing virtual teaching and then also with adult learners. They just are easier. And I find that don't pair them off. Do three or four or even five in a breakout room or even up to eight. And the reason for that is because um, some are going to close their screen or they're going to have technical difficulties. So you can have some people doing a conversation. I give them roles. There's always a captain. There's always a co-captain in case something happens with the captain. We have someone who takes notes and we have someone who reports back on what their task was, what they did, what they accomplished, what it was that they came up with. And so when you start having that and then you start having them learn how to use the um, whiteboard, they really do. It, it, what it is, is it's specific instructions. So they're not used to online learning. They don't know the expectations. So when you have each one have a job and you switch it up, then your students are able to also um, own that and then they're able to participate. The other thing is having your students own that class. One of the ways I got my students to attend, I had 98% rate of attendance in all my classes um, when I was during the pandemic and hybrid. And the reason was because things like, Oh, you get to choose the intro music. Who's going to be our person who chooses the intro music? Who's going to be our person who monitors the chat? So I gave them jobs within the synchronous classroom as well. I allowed them a day. There was Fridays and they were allowed to teach us for two minutes. If they want to screen share and teach us, one taught us about Roblox and how to build something in Roblox. 
I let it happen. One showed us how to um, play a game. One showed us how to do origami. And so having those times when they can teach um, after a while is really going to get them excited too. It's just they want to know that they, they're they allowed to do things, especially when it's online, and they're not going to get in trouble, okay, or do the wrong thing or say the wrong thing. And even if they do, you know, you can always privately talk to them and say, look, next time you do this, um, uh, just make sure you watch your language or something like that, okay, or make sure you're in a place where your parents not going to walk in the background, or your roommates going to walk around in the background or blur it or something, you know, so that way you continue with those conversations. Um, so I hope that helps with that. And a lot of polls, a lot of those emoji things to start off with so they can start uh, generating ideas and stuff like that. Don't have them participate at the beginning right away. Like don't have them unless they're saying their mood. So when you have an intro and, and you're having like what mood do you feel today, you can have that. But um, give them some time to have that language to get their brains ready for your class. Then have it like 15 minutes later. Fantastic. Really nice answer. I, I'm sure a lot of the teachers in the chat can can relate to doing a class online with a whole bunch of students and you're, you're trying to talk to them and no one's got their microphones on. No one's got their cameras on. I've definitely been in that situation and it's not fun. So what a great idea. Give give your students those tasks and make them lead something and, and uh, get everybody engaged. And also, if you if you announce like, hey, um, you know, um, Lise is going to be presenting for us today. You don't want to miss out. Then the class is going to come because they're her friends and they want to see her speak. So yeah. um, you'll find a lot more if, if you do that. I used to do it on Fridays. And so that was our big thing for Friday. Fun. Actually, this is <laughs> this is kind of a, a follow up question on this uh this person said the idea of students teaching to the class sounds fun. Can you give more examples of that? Maybe could this work with beginner levels? That's an interesting spin. Yes. So what I should say is that my other class, it was international. We had eight different languages. Um, and it was also with, um, it was in Houston. So it's very multilingual in Houston. Um, and so for that, we could teach things like customs. I had students who uh, taught us how they made tea in their country, students who showed us eating kimchi, for example. So food is a good one if you if you make a topic about food. The other is uh, customs, if they can teach us something or show us a dress. So one, um, one student put a pair of shoes and then talked about the shoes. Um, sports. They love talking about sports a lot, so that could be one. And then if you give them those uh, word banks and you give them those sentence starters in, in ways that they can use that ahead of time, then they have a reference. The other is, because it was multilingual, they could teach us something in their language. And that was one of their favorite things to do. So they would prepare almost like a language lesson and say, look, I'm going to teach you how to, in Farsi, say this how are you my name is or i'm going to teach you in you know spanish how to say it, or in vietnamese and so that was um that was a way that beginners could really do it because they were teaching us their language and then they got so excited about it they would show us their flags that's the other thing is if you do um <coughs> oh excuse me <clears throat> those culture activities where they make a flag or something and they present something from their culture then the beginners are able to talk about that. And I don't mind if they code switch. Um, it, it's shown that if they code switch and they replace a vocabulary word with a word that is like, if it's the same grammar, then that means they're learning. They just forgot the word, but they knew the grammar. They knew the structure. So I let them know, hey, if sometimes, you know, you don't know the word or I teach them how to use Google Translate and they finish a lot of tasks that way. So yes, it could work for uh, beginners. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. That's great. Okay, I'm. Let me see if I can do something here. I would like to try to share my screen. Let's see if this is going to work. 
Let me see if I so can do So for this. the ball toss, I did see one inside the chat box and it asked, mm -hmm. what serves as a virtual ball? Okay, so what I like to do is when I'm taking a physical lesson and I'm making it virtual, I will show it. I'll say like, okay, we're going to practice. And then I throw her the ball and she pretends she's catching it. And then we can do it on um, like on video. And I'll, I'll see, I'll call my student that I know always, you know, those students that always participate who love being on with me and then we'll do it first. But the other thing that works that way is like in their small, their small groups, their, their breakout rooms, they can also, you could do the emoji ball. So they, they just put the emoji ball inside the chat. And then what they do is they put the name of the name of that person. Um, and then they put like, um, they might put Santiago. I see Santiago in there. I put the ball Santiago and I say, what country are you from? Okay. And then he would answer me. He would put that ball emoji and then put um, somebody else. Elena, Elena, I want to ask you, what did you eat this morning? Okay. So they're doing it on the ball inside the chat. And then you can ask them, okay, would any of you like to come on air and then talk a little bit more about, you know, you said you were right now, um, you were eating, you know, chicken. Students love eating chicken online. I don't know why. Do you have this to show us? Do you want to talk more about it? So that uh, could be an equivalently for the ball toss, uh, ball toss activity. Great. Very <laughs> fun. Very fun. Okay. Just before we move on to our uh, award, I want to see if I can just share this. Tell me if you can see my screen. <laughs> Ah, can we see? Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> ben just sent this to me. He wanted me to share this picture of Shelly and Tara, actually. So just I going. Know. Yeah, looks like you guys are in Toronto at the CN Tower. I see her inside there right now. Yeah. <laughs> That's so when her kids to... were little, and now they're all, oh, they're all grown up. <laughs> Any idea when this could be, Shelly? Do you know how long ago this was? I think it was. I want to say like 10 years ago. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, I was, I was almost right. 11 years ago. 11 years ago. Wow. Look at that. 11 years ago. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Shelly. At all. I think she looks younger now. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Shelly. We loved your presentation. Engaging as always. And I think you gave teachers here in the audience ton of different strategies and tools that they can hopefully take back to their classrooms and use with their students. So thank you so, 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 so much for that. Ellie.